Palestinian author and foreign policy analyst Rula Jabrail has openly spoken in many of her works about Israel's apartheid regime. Tensions are still simmering between Palestine and Israel after the Israeli government put metal detectors around the Al-Aqsa Mosque in occupied East Jerusalem. The decision became a source of friction and a symbolic rally cry in the contest for control and sovereignty over the sacred compound. Rila Jabriel joins me now to talk about her own experiences. So Rila, I want to first start off with your production, Miral. It's an autobiography that was later transformed into a movie. And it's about four women that try to overcome their hardships when Israel was formed in 1948. So can you tell us your, about being born in Palestine and raised in Jerusalem? Can you tell us about your, your own outlook on the situation there? First, thank you for having me. I'm really pleased to be in Istanbul in Turkey, a country I, first of all, a city I adore, and a country that um, is a mix between East and West. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, it's a beautiful place where there's, uh, you know, plays a huge role in the Middle East, no doubt. And when you look at one of the main conflicts of this region, which is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I try to look at it from the standpoint of human rights, but above all women yeah. and women's rights. So the protagonist of my book, of my life, basically, were those amazing women. One of them in 1948 decided to build a school, an orphanage. Her reaction to the conflict, well, we have a conflict, we have a war, but we need to build the next generation. And that can happen basically through education. For her, her mission in life was building the citizens. While people were building armies in the Middle East, she was building schools, she was building opportunities. She was, she was building people so they could take off and inspire others and find solution through a non-violent, basically, approach. Uh, that was Hind Husseini. Her institution still stands since 1948. Since she found these 55 kids in the street, the smallest one was one year and a half. The oldest one was eight years. She didn't, she saw the drama, but she decided that her answer has to be hope. Yeah. And in this moment, more than ever, we need visionary people like her in the Middle East, in the region, and above all, in Israel and in Palestine. So your works are based on a lot of the things you've lived throughout your own life. Can you give us an overview of how you grew up and became the strong woman you are today? Wow. Um, I was raised in East Jerusalem in that school I was talking about. I arrived to the, to the orphanage when I was five. I won a scholarship when I was 19. I went to Italy and I became the first anchor, foreign anchor woman in Italian television. I am not no exception. It's, it's the proof that when you give people opportunity, they actually can succeed and thrive and become ambassador for their own culture. But also they, if you build women with confidence, Somebody was telling me recently that a little girl with a dream that it can women they can become and turn into women with a vision. This is what we see all over. If you give people a chance, especially women, if you invest in education, no doubt they will turn out to be confident, independent, and can build something for others and for for their communities. Uh, the women that raised me up, my teachers, my uh, professors, uh, the women in my community. I mean, I remember in, during the first intifada, one of the strongest vision I have, uh, it was the first time that Israeli came to make an arrest in our neighborhood in East Jerusalem. And they came and basically they surrounded the whole neighborhood. They rounded up everyone, everybody, every boy in there. And the mothers would not allow them to arrest. And we didn't have enough lights in the neighborhood. And the whole neighborhood came out and women came out Basically, you know, it was two o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and women came out almost in their pajamas. They did not care about the looks. What they care about is to stand up to oppression. The head of the police the next morning, it was 80, uh, probably 87 uh, or 88. The head of the police went uh, some of his people to talk to the head of the neighborhood, who was this elderly man. And he said, look, uh, we need to come to terms and you need to basically rein these women. And the head of the neighborhood looked at him and said, you head of the police asking me, head of the neighborhood, to rein women? Well, I'm scared of them. You talk to them. But it, it, it became a joke, but it was not a joke. 
when women and especially citizens know their rights, they can stand up to occupation, to oppression, to, and, and they can demand what's right. Uh, and this is what I learned from the women in my community. So I took that message wherever I worked, whether it's in Europe or in America, I knew that I have to use my voice to stand up to bigots, racists, Islamophobes, to uh, propagandists, and explain to them that our region is much more beautiful and complex than what you, they thought. For them, they see a hijabi woman and they see a threat. For me, I see something else. I see a choice, a woman that basically some of, you know, women choose like yourself yeah. to wear the hijab. They're proud of their identity. They see a mosque, like the Aqsa Mosque, and they see Islams and Muslim. I see a civilization, I see history, I see art, I see something else. And this is what I'm trying to explain to them. When they look at our region, they cannot look at us through the prism of security or their prejudice, because that defines them, not us. And I'm sure your message is gonna go a long, long way from here. Thank you so much for joining us on Thank Showcase. Thank you for having me.